turning to the 56th Psalm, if you would, Psalm 56. Psalm 56, verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid... I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape. In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of life. You never want to go out to eat an expensive meal when you have a cold. Uh, For the first reason being that you just don't feel well. But in addition you're probably not going to taste much of what you eat. You might as well just look at it and then rejoice in the knowledge that after you eat it, it's going to nourish you. But people don't go out to eat and pay a lot of money to look at food. And they don't go out to eat and pay a lot of money just to know that it's going to nourish them. They don't do that for the nutritional value. When you go out to eat and you happen to pay a lot of money for a meal, it's because you want to enjoy it. There's pleasure in it. The pleasure is not just in the eating of it, it's in the tasting of it. I'm afraid that many Christians read their Bibles as if they have a spiritual cold. We see its truths, we know that those truths are profound. We know this intellectually. So we know that we should be profoundly affected by what is written there. Knowing that we should be profoundly affected by it, sometimes we even learn how to talk about it as if we've been profoundly affected by it. And yet I think in many cases we've really experienced very little of its glory in our hearts. We've looked at it, we have to some degree, digested it, we gain nourishment from it, but have we really tasted it? I don't want to be like that, do you? I'll put it to you as plainly as this, I want to feel. I don't want to just think, I want to feel. I don't want to just see, I want to savor. I want to taste it, that which I study in the Word of God. Jason Meyer wrote a book on preaching. It's called Preaching a Biblical Theology. 
In that book, he wrote this, the main aim of preaching is not the transfer of information, but an encounter with the living God. The people of God meet God in the anointed heralding of God's message in a way that cannot be duplicated by any other means. Preaching in a worship service is not a lecture in a classroom. It is the echo of and the exultation over God speaking to us in His Word. To that I say amen. John Piper, in his preface to the supremacy of God in preaching, wrote this. He said, there are always two parts to true worship. There is seeing God and there's savoring God. You can't separate these. You must see Him to savor Him. And if you don't savor Him when you see Him, you insult Him. In true worship, there is always understanding with the mind, and there's always feeling in the heart. Understanding must always be the foundation of feeling, or all we have is baseless emotionalism. But understanding of God that doesn't give rise to feeling for God becomes mere intellectualism and deadness. This is why the Bible continually calls us to think and to consider and meditate on the one hand and to rejoice and to fear and to mourn and to delight and to hope and to be glad on the other hand. Both are essential for worship. The reason the Word of God takes the form of preaching and worship is that true preaching is the kind of speech that consistently unites these two aspects of worship, both in the way that it's done and in the aims that it has. And I would say to us tonight that what is true of preaching is true of our lives. As I said a moment ago, I don't want to just think about God. I want to commune with God. I want to adore God. And I want to feel. I want to feel my sorrows, and I want to feel my celebrations. I want, to, I want to sense that I'm living, and I want to sense that I'm on my way to death, which means I'm on my way to an immortal existence, everlasting existence in the presence of God. I want to sense that. I don't want life to go on around me while I'm oblivious to it. I mean, oblivious to the weightiness of what it is we're actually dealing with in this life, in this world. I think there are many people living like that. There are monumental things going on every single day in their own life and all around them. And we, we go through life with our face in a television set or a mobile device or business reports or whatever the case may be. And days come and days go and we've never really sensed the weightiness of what it is we're engaged in. But I don't want to sense any of this outside of the truth of God's Word. I don't want to sense any of this outside of faith, trust in the living God. You can be sober-minded and not be morbid. I don't want to be morbid, but I do want to be sober-minded. This is why I love the Psalms. This is where I go when my affections feel thin. If God never meant for us to feel, He wouldn't have given us the book of Psalms. Because they're full of feeling, aren't they? Feeling runs all through them. There are heights, there are depths, there are sorrows, there are joys, there are questions, there are answers, there are doubts, there are convictions. But through it all is worship. All of this is in the Psalms because all of this is experienced in the life of a worshiper. You walk with God and you're going to have heights and you're going to have depths. You're going to have sorrows and you're going to have joys. You're going to have times of fear. You're going to have times of confidence. Times of doubt, times of conviction. But through it all, you learn to worship. David was a man who walked with God. He was a man used by God, chosen by God for great things, which would mean he would also experience great tests. 
God never does great things with anyone that he doesn't allow them to face great tests. You can't point me to one person on the pages of God's Word that had some role in the drama of redemption, that had some great responsibility imparted to him or to her who was not sorely tested. Well, every child of God has been given great privilege. Therefore, every child of God has been given great responsibility. Therefore, every child of God can expect great tests. And what we have in Psalm 56 is David telling us about the kind of communion that goes on in the life of a servant of God in the midst of a great and fearful test. The superscription of the psalm tells us that This psalm arose out of an experience in David's life when he had been seized by the Philistines in Gath. He was afraid. And yet the psalm is written in a way that it clearly applies to all sorts of persecution and mistreatment and fear. You see, anything that would fill our hearts with doubt. We're being shown how to worship God. In the face of that which we feel threatens us, in the face of that which makes us feel afraid, in the face of anything where we are face to face with our great neediness for God. I wonder if there's someone sitting before me tonight. You're coming face to face with your great neediness for God. You have something going on in your life that makes you afraid or makes you sense your mortality or somehow fills your heart with doubts. Well, David had been there, and he wrote about it. What he writes is so simple, it's so straightforward, which actually makes it so gracious. You know, when you're hurting, you need a balm, not a puzzle. He doesn't give us a puzzle, he gives us a balm. He tells us in very simple terms how to commune with God in the midst of a great test. And he, it's like he puts it down on the lower shelf. You know, when you're hurting, it's like you're in a weakened condition. Can't lift up very high. So this is just ready for digestion. Just take it into your soul and taste it. Reflect upon your own situation and realize just how faithful God is, therefore how confident you can be as a child of God. This psalm has been divided up in a number of different ways by scholars and commentators. We're just going to take a very simple approach to it. I want to look at it in seven parts. The first thing I want you to see with me is this, a plea for undeserved help. Verses 1 and 2, a plea for undeserved help. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long. For many attack me proudly. The psalmist feels the pressure of human opposition. It's not just one enemy that he has, verse 2. He has multiple enemies. In fact, he describes this enemy in the terms of mankind in verse 1. For man, that is man, generally speaking, mankind tramples on me. Points to the true nature of fallen mankind. Mankind's like a monster. Bloodthirsty. Those who would pursue him are cruel, relentless, tireless, hateful. They seek his life. There in verse 1 where it says they trample on him, there's in that word the idea of panting after. Like like you're, you're dogging someone's steps. The relentless nature of what he's facing is emphasized when twice he uses the words all day. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long. They attack him, verse 2. They do it with an uplifted heart. The nature of the opposition is seen. It is vicious. It is relentless. It's full of arrogance. 
And so what does he do? He is asking God for help. It's very instructive how he does it because he puts it in the terms of mercy. Be gracious to me, oh God. Be gracious to me. He doesn't describe the help that he needs and wants as something that he deserves, but something that would be a mercy to him. The second thing I want you to see, verses 3 through 4, is that in the midst of this plea for merciful help, noting the nature of the pressure that he's under, in verses 3 and 4, we see a confession of courageous trust. He says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? This is a choice, isn't it, that he's making? It is, it is a principled choice. It's based upon knowledge. It is a timely choice. It's in the day of his fear, verse 3, when he is afraid, in the t- at the time of his fear, that he makes this principled choice of putting his trust in God. He wants to be sure that we understand who is the object of his courage, who is the object of his trust in these situations, he repeats it, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. My trust is not going to be in the arm of the flesh. My trust is not going to be in my own abilities. My trust is not going to be in the falling out of circumstances that the world would refer to as, as luck or th- you know, things just working out okay for me. No, my trust will be in God. It's a very transparent thing, though, that he does, isn't it? Because he acknowledges that he gets afraid. He says, when I am afraid, I will choose to put my trust in God when I am afraid. And this very choice to trust God means putting fear away. At the end of verse, or in the middle of verse 4, he says, I shall not be afraid. I will choose trust in the place of fear. I will put fear away by trusting in you, God. This is an informed choice. Notice the God in whom he trusts is the God whose word he praises. This is the content of his trust. This is how he has come to trust in God. He has learned the word of God is trustworthy. So his trust in God is word-centered. And this is not some begrudging resignation. I guess I'm left with nothing else except to trust God. No, it's nothing like that because this word he praises. So this is admiring trust. Not begrudging trust, not resigned trust, but admiring trust. He admires and truly trusts the God whose word he praises. It's a faith choice. It's an emphatic choice. It's an informed choice. It's an admiring choice. It's a contrastive choice because he says at the end of verse 4, what can flesh do to me? You see, I realize who, the, who the, the two sides are in this battle. Man sets himself against me, but I'm looking to God as my defender. And if God is for me, what can man do to me? What can man do to me? What can flesh, mere flesh, do to me when my trust is in Elohim? My trust is in the living, powerful God who made heaven and earth and rules over everything. No contest. So acknowledging his fear, he chooses the position of courage, and he chooses the position of courage by placing his faith and trust in God. And he does it in an 
emphatic way, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. You see, the cry for mercy also requires choices, doesn't it? God, be merciful to me, but it also requires that now I trust Him. As I plead, plead with Him for grace, I also put myself in the position of trust. I will trust Him. Third thing I want you to see, verses 5 and 6, notice now He, he elaborates on the specific way that he's meeting with this opposition. He wants us to feel the pressure that he's under. It's one thing to say it goes on all day. People are panting at my heels. They are pursuing my life. They're bloodthirsty. They, they attack me. They oppress me. It's all day long. It's one thing to describe it that way. That's vivid enough, but he's not done. Verses 5 and 6, he's going to tell us more specifically what it is he's facing. He says, all day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. First, he says, they distort my words. That's what it means in verse 5 there where it says all day long they injure my cause. The idea is a distortion of his words. They twist his words. I don't know if you've ever been there, but you know it is a very insecure feeling when someone is accusing you of something by a distortion of your motives, of your thoughts, of your words, of your actions. In fact, in some cases... The Lord must be your helper because from a human point of view, there is no way really to defend yourself. In some cases, you're talking about two people. One person says one thing, the other person says another thing, and if the person who is attacking is distorting the picture, distorting your words, distorting your motives, well, how do you defend against that? It's true or it's false, but only the two of you really know. He's experiencing that, the distortion of his words. He also says, they are inventing ways to hurt me. All their thoughts, he says, are against me for evil. So there's a meditation going on. There's a planning going on. There's a consideration going on of how to do evil to him. The Net Bible translates this, they make a habit of plotting my demise. He says they attack him. They stir up strife, he says. The idea is they attack him or they stalk him. They're not forthright in what they do. He says they lurk. They they hide. They lie in wait for him. Stealth is involved in what he's facing. And it's like they're spying on him. They watch him closely for the purpose of killing him. They watch my steps, he says, as they have waited for my life. And he repeats, this is the third time now he said this, he he repeats in verse 5 that it's all day long. Wouldn't you agree that this is psychological pressure? I mean, this, this, apart from faith in God, would fill your heart with fear, keep you up at night, not allow you any rest. Can I ask you tonight, what is it that has you under psychological pressure? What is it that keeps you up at night? What is it that fills your heart with dread? What is it that troubles your soul? may not be exactly what David was facing, but... God hasn't changed. His trustworthiness hasn't changed. His word hasn't changed. What he expresses in this psalm is as true for your situation as it was for David's situation. 
So he cries out to God for, for gracious help. He describes the pressure that he's under. He confesses a courageous confidence in God and a very specific kind of confidence. It is, it is faith in God whose word he praises. So the content of his confidence is described in terms of God's revelation. And yet he wants us to know just how heavy a weight this is. This is no light thing that he's facing. This is no light thing at all. The distortion of his words, the invention of ways to hurt him, the attack upon his person, the stealth that's involved, the spying out for the purpose of killing him all day long. Fourth thing I want you to notice, a call for divine justice that expresses tender care. This is verses 7 and 8. A cry for divine justice that will express God's tender care for him. He says, for their crime, will they escape? Lord, will they get away with this? Will this go unanswered? And so he cries out to God for justice. He says, in wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. What is he doing? He's asking the Lord to intervene, to come to his defense, to help him, to save him, to deliver him. He's already noted in verse 1, he doesn't think he's faultless. This will be a gracious defense. This will be a merciful defense. He's not faultless, but he is righteous. Though he's not faultless, he really does love God. Though he's not faultless, he really is a servant of God. He really does represent the cause of God. And listen, it's not godly people who attack you like this. Wicked people attack you like this. And so he's asking for the Lord to defend one of his children. That's what he's asking for. And he's not wrong to do it. And can I say to you tonight, with the right kind of perspective and the right kind of heart, you can do the same. When you are wrongfully opposed, it is not wrong to ask God to come to your defense. To ask God to oppose wickedness. To cry out to God for a holy, fatherly kind of anger. To rain down upon the one who would injure one of his children. And I want you to see that he ties this cry together with the knowledge of God's genuine care for him. Because right after asking God to do this, what does he say? Verse 8, you have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? God, you know every step that I've taken as I have been pursued. You'll notice if you, if you have the New American Standard, that is translated, my wanderings. You've kept count of my wanderings. You know, when you're in this kind of pressure situation, sometimes it's hard to even remember where you've been and where you're going. It feels like you're losing your way. And he says, Lord, in the midst of this pressure situation, you know all of my wanderings. Here's a man, if indeed the superscription reflects where this arose from. Then you've got David fleeing from Saul under intense pressure. And he says, you know, you know where I've been in my running from him? God, you've taken note of every tear that I've shed. You, you have kept them in your wineskin. You have recorded and remembered every moment of grief, every moment of heartache. Aren't they all in your book? And of course, they are. He is confident. He is confident that God truly cares for him. I just want to ask you tonight, in the midst of your pressure situation, do you really believe that God really cares for you? 
that he really cares, that he really takes note of your tossings or wanderings, that he really takes note of your tears, that he really takes note of your grief and heartache. Is this true? It is true, and David knows that it's true. So that he returns to a confession of faith. But this time you'll notice he does it with a strengthened confidence. This is what's wonderful about preaching to yourself. You can begin in one place and finish in another. You can, when you preach faithfully the Word of God to yourself and remind yourself of who your God is and what He does and how He acts toward His children, you can begin with sort of a courageous faith that has to look in the face of fear and overcome it with an understanding of who He is and what He does, but finish with no fear because you know these things are true. Notice his confidence. He says in verse 9, Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In Yahweh, whose word I praise. In God, I trust. doesn't say it twice. Now he says it three times. I trust in God. I trust in God. I trust in God. Whose word I praise. And now he doesn't say, and when I'm afraid, I'll trust him. He says, I shall not be afraid. And he ends on the same note. What can man do to me, a confession of confident trust. Confident in God's favor and love, faithfulness. Confident in God's answer to prayer. Are you confident that when you cry out to God for his help, he hears you and he answers? And by the way, you know this, church, you're You're mature enough, you know this, but I want to underscore this. We understand, do we not, that though the Lord is for us and though He does love us and care for us and faithfully answers our prayers, His ways are still mysterious to us, aren't they? doesn't always turn out the way we thought it would or the way we would have preferred. But it in no way lessens what He's saying right here, in no way. That's where faith operates. When we know that all of this is true, even when it seems like to us it would be different if it were true, we still know that it's true. It's interesting, isn't it, that he says in verse 4, what can flesh do to me? And then in verse 5 and verse 6, he talks about all the things that flesh and blood are doing to him. (laughs) I mean, in the short term, in the immediate, men can do a lot of harm to us. But in the ultimate sense, men can do no harm to us. And that's the perspective that we have to have. We may feel the pain of human opposition, but at the end of the day, our place with God is secure. And so his eyes of faith are turned in the direction of the faithfulness of God. And he knows that when he calls, God will come to his defense, verse 9. He knows that God is for him. He will trust in God. He will not be afraid. And he knows that God's sovereignty rules over everything so that men really can't do a thing to him. Nothing. That's the place of peace. That's what we must believe and confess. And now when he comes to the end of the psalm, he turns his mind and his heart to what lies beyond the crisis. This is how he is communed with God in the midst of the crisis, but now what is he going to do on the other side of the crisis? He's already contemplating that as he writes this. What is on the other side of the crisis? And his faith enables him to look beyond this trial in terms of its completion what's on the other side of it. And what he does in verse 12 is he promises something. He vows something. He reflects on vows and promises that he's made. He promises grateful worship. 
I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. I will give you thanks. He promises sacrifices of praise, probably involving prescribed acts of worship, but also expressed in the words of song, as he's doing in this song. It's a good reminder for us. Deliverance deserves remembrance. Deliverance deserves to be remembered. Protection deserves praise. Have you remembered lately how much God has done for you in Jesus Christ? Have you taken note not only of the eternal deliverance that we've been studying about in the book of Hebrews, but if you, have you really remembered lately how often the Lord has been your helper in this temporal world? How often He has rescued you. How often He has protected you. How often He has provided for you. How many times your steps were wavering and He solidified your walk. How many times He has come to your defense. Have you remembered that lately? You know you should. Dear ones, should we not be a thankful people, full of praise for who God is and all that He's done? And you know, when you remember what He's done in the past, doesn't that strengthen you in the present? And doesn't that strengthen you for the future? God's past faithfulness, is it not a commentary on His future faithfulness. He doesn't forget you. He doesn't change. He hasn't stopped loving you. He doesn't lack any power. Won't He care for you in the days to come when He's cared for you in so many different ways in the days gone by? So He promises thanksgiving but this is so important how he finishes. He understands that this deliverance is not just for moments of praise and thanksgiving. It's not, God, you've been good to me, so let me give you a song of praise. You've been good to me, so let me offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Look at what he says in verse 13. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. God's deliverance of us imparts a purpose for us. His deliverance means our devotion. It's not an act of praise, it's a life of praise. It's not a momentary song of thanksgiving or sacrifice of thanksgiving, it's a life of thanksgiving and worship and praise and devotion. This is what His deliverance requires of us. David says, you've saved my life that I may walk before you. In the light of life. In a world of unbelief, there's just darkness. But in this life of faith that you've taught me and introduced me into, there's nothing but light. You've saved me to walk in that. Have you connected that? Have you seen that you've been delivered to be devoted to a lifetime of worship. Charles Spurgeon said this, he says, describing David's attitude here, he says, walking at liberty, in holy service, in sacred communion, in constant progress and holiness, enjoying the smile of heaven, this I seek after. Here is the loftiest reach of a good person's ambition to dwell with God, to walk in righteousness before Him, to rejoice in His presence, 
and in the light and glory which it yields. Thus, in this short psalm, we have climbed from the ravenous jaws of the enemy into the light of Jehovah's presence, a path which only faith can tread. You see, we're not just to see these things. We're to savor these things. We don't simply acknowledge God's grace to us. We respond to God's grace to us. And how do we respond? We don't fear. We trust. We don't fret. We rest. We don't doubt. We believe. We don't respond to such mercy with a wasteful life. We respond to such mercy with a worshiping life. We don't just see him and not savor him and in that way insult him. We confess that he is our life. And we can trust him. Not because we're good, but because he's good. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, this is what we want to be and do. You have made us alive and we want to walk in the light of life. Trusting you, believing you, resting in you. When we're afraid, running to you. Crying out to you. Where does our help come from? It comes from you, Lord. It comes from you. We're not faultless. But due to your saving work in our lives, we are righteous. We do love you. You've made us your children. We do belong to you. And so we know, Lord, that you are for us. We know that you really do care for us. Our tears don't fall to the ground, they are kept in your bottle. Our sorrows, our griefs, our questions don't go unnoticed. They're kept in your book. Even in times where we feel alone, we are never alone. There's never a moment that we're not loved. There's never a moment that we're not cared for. There's never a moment that all the circumstances of our life are not regulated and sovereignly orchestrated by the loving hand of our Father. For this, God, we give you great praise. You have saved us that we might live for you. And so I pray that we would with hearts that feel as well as see. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.